Okay. Uh, today we've got um, a new topic. This topic is for exam two, so it's not something that's going to be on exam one. We're just kind of getting into it. If there are questions for or from exam one, then um, then we'll we'll answer those as we go. Looks like the stream is kind of it was bumpy there at the beginning, but looks like it's okay right now. Um, so I'll just look and say, well, let me, you know, let me check and see if there are any questions over on Discord before we get too far. Because um, there could be some over there that I didn't didn't think about that could be. So let's go over there for a second. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's nothing specific. Let's see. All right, so nothing there that looks specific. So if you come up with something, um, we'll probably cover those near the end. Um, exam one is tomorrow at noon. So, um, or well, there's an alternate test time at 7.30 also. So um, one of those times, if you're not taking it during one of those times, then we need to set up a external proctor for some other time. Um, but uh, the new topic, for today is called frames and machines. And um, they're lumped together, frames and machines. You treat them mostly the same when you're trying to analyze the forces inside these things. They look, or they can look, similar to uh, trusses, but they are not the same. Um, parts of frames and machines can be the same as trusses, but they are not uh, the same thing. Uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna need to analyze them in a different way than we do frame uh, trusses. Uh, let's get a sheet. I forgot to add our sheet here. Let me do that real quick. And let's give it a some dots. All right. Uh, so let's bring that over here. Go over here. All right. So frames and machines. Let me. I need to kind of rearrange stuff up here to yeah it looks better all right oh well something unusual is going on and not sure what it is let me let me see we may have a bit of an issue hold on Hold on. The pin is not working quite right this morning, so I might have to uh, see if I can get it to trigger here. I don't think there's anything actually wrong with it. I think the software is just giving us a problem. Let's see. wonder if I accidentally um, unplugged it. Let's let's make sure that all these USBs, there's all kinds of USBs. Oh, I think I think it was unplugged. All right, now we're good. All right, fixed it. All right, now we'll talk about frames and machines. And it might be good to actually review a little bit of the idea of trusses um, before we talk about frames and machines because they're, uh, since they are, or they can look similar, um, we don't want to d uh, mix them up. We don't want to uh, treat a frame and machine and machine or machine uh, like a truss. So let's go back first and talk about uh, trusses. So we made a couple of um, assumptions about how a truss is built or how that we can analyze it. Uh, and those assumptions led us down this path where every member in the truss 
was a two-force member, and we'll have to redefine what that means in the context of frame of machine. Um, and uh, it also led us down the method of joints and the method of sections. So the method of joints and method of sections don't work for frames of machines. So that's going to be a key concept is that um, once we've identified this thing as being a frame or a machine, then we can't use method of joints or method of sections because different things are happening. So that's where we want to get to today basically is what's the difference in a frame and a machine from a truss? Uh, and then once we get there, how do we deal with frames and machines? So let's start with what we said a couple, maybe probably last week, uh, about trusses. So USB devices are keeping, uh, I guess when I re-plugged it in, it reset everything. So you keep hearing some dings. All right, so the trusses. So one of the things that uh, we said was true about a truss is that any external force... So any of, not the forces like inside the members themselves, but any force applied to the whole truss. So external forces um, were, a, or let's not do were, they are, are applied only at joints. And we also called the joints pins. So either one. So for instance, if we, let's draw a little truss. Now, technically, this is not a truss um, because that middle section that has a square in it, it's not triangulated. So this would not behave the same way that a truss would behave. So we need to put a member in there to make sure that all the little enclosed shapes are triangles. If they are, um, if they're not triangles, for instance, let's, let's take a little aside for a second. And if we had this shape, you know, pinned together, then there's nothing holding this shape in this particular configuration. Um, if we put a little force over here, then this shape would easily, remember all these dots I'm drawing, these are pins. They're, um, they're allowed to rotate and move around. So if I put a force over here, then this shape would easily, you know, do something like this. It's not stable. But as soon as I put uh, the triangulation piece in there, you know, this piece, then um, now all of a sudden, instead of one square or rectangle, that is two triangles and the triangles can't sh change shape. They're locked down to the whatever shape they are. They can't deform without like bending one of the members, which we're assuming is not happening. Um, so that's not really what I was trying to talk about for this step, but that's just an aside that you can't have these non-triangular shapes inside a truss um, or it's technically going to behave differently than a truss would. All right. Um, so where member forces can be applied. So we can apply them at any one of these pins, however we wanted to. But what we can't do is we can't, say, put a load here right on the middle of that member. Um, it, that load, if we need a load there, then we need to take half of it and put it on either end where the pins are. Um, so this one does not work. Um, any force applied to the members themselves that are, that can't be moved to a pin makes this not work as a truss. It makes the method of sections and method of joints not work. Um, and then suddenly we have to analyze this structure like it's a frame. Okay. Um, so that was one thing that we said for trusses. Just checking. All right. Um, another thing we said is that, and I just kind of said this, the joints or the pins, whichever you want to call them. Let me having a little little issue with that. Let's do that. All right. Joints. Oh, uh, maybe I should move it the other way. I know it's not showing up on your screen, it's just messing with my screen. And it doesn't matter if you refer to these as joints or pins, uh, they're interchangeable terms. Um, 
the uh, truss assumption is that these are frictionless. I don't know what is acting up here. Frictionless. So, um, for instance, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to make sure that every joint ends up acting like a concurrent force system. Whether it's 2D or 3D, doesn't matter. Um, we're only doing 2D trusses, um, but um, we're trying to make sure that the joints themselves, while in real life, you know, it might be bolted down or whatever, we're trying to make sure there's not a moment applied at that joint. So we say that the joints are modeled as frictionless pins. Um, so what that means is that there's no concentrated moment at a pin. Okay. Um, we also said that you could ignore the weight of the members. Now, it might be that you take care of it a different way. So either you ignore it entirely, like they, uh, the weight of the beams that hold it made up, the truss is made of, um, is negligible compared to the actual forces that it's dealing with, and you just ignore the weight. Or if they are heavy, so they're, you know, 30 thousand pounds or whatever and it, and it really is a significant force that you have to consider then you can't do according to little bullet point number one up here you can't uh, apply that uh, force to the member itself even as a distributed load but what you could do is you could say take 15,000 pounds and put it at one end of the beam and 15,000 pounds and put it at the other end and I use the word beam but it's really member um, and so if you had to take care of the weight of the members, that's how you would do it. Now on exam problems and homework problems, unless it specifically tells you to consider the weight of the members, then the assumption is you're just ignoring the weight of the members. Um, okay, let's see. I think there was one other thing we said. Oh, well, um, as a result of these things, these three assumptions, then every member... ends up being a two force member and as a result of that you have the method of joints that you can use mm -hmm. or method of sections so those are um, an outcome being able to use method of joints or method of sections is an outcome of all of these assumptions that we're making. Um, and let's just make sure that we know what a two-force member is. So the advantage of the two-force member is that, um, let's just draw a member. So this will be member AB. And um, it doesn't even have to have any force. Well, it can't have any forces applied directly to it because that's our number one point up here is that external forces are only at the joints. So it could have some uh, B is a pin. So remember when we've done um, external reactions and we had a pin, uh, they have two reactions. So there's a BX and a BY. And then uh, A is also a pin. So there could be a AY and an AX, I'm just drawing them in whatever direction feels okay to draw them in. The direction I'm drawing these is not important right now. Um, so I've got these four forces that are acting on member AB. Once I determine that it's a two force member, which means that there are um, only two pins, so there's not like a pin C connected to this thing, there is uh, no external force applied to the member itself. This BX and BY are at the pins, but not to the body of the member. Then I can say that, well, this is a two-force member. And once I know it's a two-force member, then... So, 
as long as I know it's a two force member, when I go to draw its free body diagram, instead of drawing AX, AY, BX, BY, I can just draw the force in member AB. There's the two forces. They actually have the same magnitude. They have, op they have to have opposite directions so that they're in equilibrium. If I drew them both pointing up and to the right, then member AB would be moving up and to the right. So they have to have opposite directions, um, same magnitude. But those are the two forces. That and that are the two forces. So there and they're only one value. So I went from four unknowns, AX, AY, BX, and BY, four unknowns, to one unknown, FAB. I even know what angle it's at. I don't know if it's tension or compression. So unless I have other context to know if it should be tension or compression, I don't know that part. But I know that the angle or the line of action for force AB is you just connect the dots. So connect pin A to pin B. No matter what shape the member is, normally they're straight, but they could be curved or whatever. So you could have, I don't know, you could have something that's an S shape if you really wanted to. And the line of action would still be connect the dots between those two points and your force is on that line of action. I have drawn these in tension because they're pointing away from the body, uh, the little member free body that I drew. If you wanted to be in compression, then you would point them both towards the body uh, and that would show a compressive force. Um, so that's the value of two force member is that it eliminates all these unknowns otherwise. Um, and every member in a truss is a two force member or a zero force member. You know, it could be that it has uh, zero force on it, but uh, they're, they're all two force members or zero. The difference is that for a, a frame and machine is one of these little assumptions, at least one, maybe more than one, uh, is not true. And it's usually this first one, external forces are applied to the member itself and not to the pins. Um, so for a frame and a machine, at least one truss assumption is not true. And usually there is an external force applied directly to a member and you can't move it to the joints or the pins. There could be other things like maybe you've got uh, a fixed support so it's not a pin at all. Um, a roller is okay. A roller acts mostly like a pin so uh, it doesn't matter if it's a roller but you could have a fixed support. Um, maybe you can't ignore the weight and you can't distribute the weight the way I talked about moving it to both ends. You have to keep it as a distributed load. Uh, so there's things like that that um, happen and what that means is that now there could be some two force members, not, not guaranteed, but there could be, but there's definitely some pieces of the frame or the machine that are not two force members. So you cannot use method of joints. So not all members are two force members. So therefore, you cannot use method of joints and method of sections. And so that's the biggest thing is that you've got to recognize when um, you're dealing with a frame or a machine versus dealing with a truss. Now that's kind of easy in the context of the class because trusses are on exam one and frames and machines are, are on exam two. Um, 
Uh, yeah, the question is, is similar to what we covered in Method of Joints. Uh, the two-force member, yes. Uh, so the two-force members, every piece of a truss is a two-force member. So all of this, I kind of just redid. <laughs> this is this is kind of review here. Um, every piece of a truss is a two-force member. Not every piece of a frame or machine is a two-force member. So as a result of that, the big outcome is that you cannot use method of joints and or method of sections when you're dealing with a frame or machine. And then I was saying that um, the uh, in the context of the class, they're just divided in time. So you kind of can know when you're doing frames versus know when you're doing trusses. Um, except for exam three, there's some of both. So uh, you do have to be able to tell them apart by the end of the quarter. Um, and the easiest way usually that you're going to tell a frame or machine from a truss is that either the frame has a force applied to a member, an external force applied to the body of a member, or uh, there instead of a pin and a roller holding the thing up, there's a fixed support. So those are usually the two giveaways um, that you're dealing with a frame or a machine. To tell the difference in frame and machine is more a frame is a rigid structure, it doesn't really move. Um, and a machine is like pliers or a backhoe or something like that where it's intended to move. So they're, they're the same concept. It's just different terminology for is it static in place or is it able to move? Now, in our class, everything is in static equilibrium, even the machines. So even though they could move, they're doing some kind of job where they're in a certain position and they're not actually moving and accelerating. Um, okay, so I think maybe an example would be good here for what we are going to do with a uh, frame. So let's just take a really simple one. The simplest one we could have has three pieces. So here's some top, this is going to be like a shelf bracket or something that's pinned together instead of one solid piece. Okay, let's call this A, and this is going to be um, pinned to a wall, and then over here, this part will be attached with a roller. Now, in real world, you probably have two pins or something like that. Um, if you're screwing this thing to the wall, it's probably not even acting like a frame. It's acting like one single bracket anyway. Um, but um, we're kind of, you know, making this work for our version of a frame right now. So right now, it actually still counts as a truss. Actually, right now, it's not doing anything because there's no forces on it. Um, but if this is a shelf bracket, then let's imagine we've got a, uh, you know, a stack of books here and they're heavy books and I could go in and you know just do what we did at the end of last class where we took a distributed load and lumped it into a point load I could do that um, but let's say that instead what I'm going to do is I want to treat these books as a distributed load um, and even if I had them as a point load maybe we'll just put them as a point load for now um, but I'm going to put the point load on member AB. So when I go to draw the free body diagram of our frame, which would look like this, this is not the free body diagram. That's like the sketch of the thing. So the free body diagram would be the pieces. One, two, three, four. Looks like that long. And I drew it down to here. And then I drew this one. And I replace all the connections and contacts with forces. So the books become, I'll do them a point load. I did, originally thought I would do a distributed load, but we'll just do a single point load for this point uh, in time. Let's say that those books weighed 30 pounds. So we had a lot of books there. And let's go ahead and label a, B, and C. A 
is a pin and we have to replace pins with an X and Y reaction. So I'll put AX and AY. C is a roller. We replace the roller with the um, normal force. So normal to the surface that the roller is rolling along. So the roller is rolling along this vertical wall. So normal perpendicular to that is horizontal. So we'll just put this. So I end up with these three unknowns, AX, AY, and CY. And usually what I'm trying to do with a frame or a machine is same thing I'm trying to do with a truss. I want to know what force is acting on each one of the pieces. Um, and so for a truss, we go over and do method of joints or method of sections, and then we can do stress calculations or axial deformation or things like that. Here, um, I can't treat it like a truss because that 130 pound if it wasn't for that 30 pounds it would act just like a truss or if i put that 30 pounds over here you know if it was over here at b it's acting just like a truss but when i put the 30 pounds on member a b that adds a third force to member a b and it's not a two force member anymore so i can't i have to i have to use the b x b y a x a y i have to have to use that kind of setup i can't call it a two force member um, so that's my first step draw the free body diagram and then the next step is uh, sort of optional but it's good to go ahead and do is so we'll call this step one free body diagram step two is look for two force members because it could be that some of the pieces are two force members and if they are that will help you in fact in this class if you're working on a frame or a machine and you're stuck, you just have too many variables to solve for, and you are pretty certain you've drawn all the free body diagrams correctly, then probably what's happening is you're missing a two force member. Like there's a two force member in the tr uh, frame or the machine and you labeled it as if it was a regular member and you did, you did this kind of thing, you know, B, X, B, Y, A, X, A, Y, and you just have too many unknowns. Um, so there's a good chance that if you are drawing free body diagrams and you have too many extra unknowns, you probably missed a two force member somewhere. Okay. So in this case, there are some two force members. So to find a two force member, you're looking for basically pieces that the, obey the trust rules. So um, one that m I may not have actually stated with the trust rules the first time I talked about them, but um, a member with, whoops, let me retry that, with only two pins. So if you ever have a member ABC where there's three pins and they don't have to be pins, they can be pins, they can be a slot, a roller, you know, stuff like that. Um, but if you have more than two of them, then uh, it is definitely not a two force member. Um, so in this case, members, they all, AB has two, and you, can usually, you can usually tell by the name because it's, the name is coming from the pins and the other places on the member so a b has member is a uh, member with only two pins a c is same b c is the same so all of them could be two force members so a member with only two pins and then no external force applied to the body of the member So um, member AB has 30 pounds applied to it. So it does not fall into the rules here. Um, but member AC, it does have external forces, but they're at A and they're at C, which that's fine. We can do that. We just can't put them between A and C somewhere or um, we can't put them on the body itself. So AC is a two force member and BC is a two force member. 
So knowing that helps us um, when we go to draw the free body diagrams. So look for two force members. Technically that's optional, but usually it helps out. Um, the third part, well, the third thing you do is now um, you, it depends. So you have the two options here. We have frames and we have machines. And this part I'm going to tell you is one of those, like you usually do this whenever it's a frame, you usually do this when it's a machine, but there could be exceptions. So if it's a frame, then usually, and in this case, it's almost always, but there could be except that I mean, I'm not going to say always because there's always going to be some kind of exception. You almost always solve for the external reactions first. In this case, um, I mean AX, AY, and CY. Oh, that should be CX. I don't know why I called it CY. I just now noticed there. Um, that should be CX because it's going in the X direction. Um, if it's a machine, though, this is not a machine. But if it is a machine, then you almost always skip this step and go to the next one. Um, because a lot of times you're either given the external reactions or you just can't find them yet. So machines, the opposite. And again, it's not 100% true. Almost always uh, skip to step four. But again, not 100% of the time, just that's generally true. Um, so in our case, well, we do have a frame. So we look at it. Um, the whole point of this is to hold those books up, not to be moving around somewhere. So, and, and if we look at the uh, way it's constructed, there's no, comp there's no way that anything can move. It's just a triangle. So um, unless the members themselves change shape, which we don't want to happen, then it's going to stay that same triangle and it becomes a frame. Um, so that does lead us into, well, let's solve for... AX, AY, CX. I'm going to take and copy our diagram here so that we can work on it down here. Um, we need some dimensions though. We can't do anything without any sizes on here. So that looks like it's one, two, three, four. That's five. Um, we'll do five inches. That looks like three inches. And that looks like four inches. Okay, so it's not a very big deal, but uh, maybe we could do 10 and 17, or 10 and 14, but we'll just leave it like this. It doesn't matter. Um, all right, so we're going to solve for the external reactions. Normally the best step when you're doing that, whether it's a frame or a beam or a truss, and you're trying to do those first external reactions at the pin and roller or at the fixed support or wherever it is, then usually the first thing to do is do the summation of moments about the pin. In this case, the pin holding this thing together, or not holding it together, holding it to the wall is A. And we'll do clockwise positive. And that will tell us AX and AY, they do not create moments about point A because their line of action, their lines of action actually intersect point A. The 30 pounds does and it tries to make it go clockwise. CX does and it tries to make it go counterclockwise. So the only unknown in there is CX and it equals, gotta get the calculator, let's see 30 times 3 divided by five, 18 pounds. Um, that came out positive. That means that I uh, drew the right arrow direction for CX. So that's good. 
Then um, AX and AY, let's do AY. Summation of forces in the Y direction to find AY. Um, and it just says AY minus 30 pounds equals zero. So that's easy, AY equals 30 pounds. Also positive, so that means that the arrow is chosen the right direction. So that's good. Let's do the last one. Summation of forces in the X direction equals zero. I have AX plus CX equals zero. Um, we just found a value for CX. So AX plus 18 pounds equals zero. AX equals negative 18 pounds. So that negative sign, uh, arrow that I drew for AX is the opposite direction. So you can either go in and uh, redraw the free body diagram and change the AX arrow to go the right way and then AX becomes positive or you can keep track of the negative 18 sign. So right now I'm just gonna leave it alone and keep track of the negative 18. Okay, so that was step three. And again, if you're dealing with a machine where it's pretty obvious that the thing can change shape somehow, it has linkages that are arranged to where it can move like a pair of pliers or whatever, and uh, then you might not be able to do this step. You might have to skip to this next piece. All right, so step four. Let's put it right here, I guess. So we just did uh, external reactions because we had a frame. If we had a machine, we'd probably just do this step. And this one is you, um, I'm going to call it unpin each member and draw a separate free body diagram for each member. All right, so for us, that would mean we would look at member AB and draw uh, the free body diagram for AB. Then we'd look at AC, do that, BC. You don't have to always do every single one of them, but um, sometimes you end up, I will do all of them. They're redundant in this case, but um, just so we have practice at what they look like. Um, what exactly are we aiming to achieve when we attempt to support the books? Oh. Well, in, I assume you mean in this picture, it's to hold the books up. This is like a bracket that would be under a bookshelf or something. Um, oh, yeah. So the whole point would be um, if you're engineering. Now, this is, again, an extreme, ex extremely on the simple side example, and it probably doesn't get that much engineering done. Um, so this would probably be. If I were engineering this, you know, our, our loads and sizes are multiplied to much larger degree. So the, the goal would be I need to know how big or what material or how big and what material, what cross section. I need to know all of the details of what member AB is so that it doesn't fail. Like that would be the point of engineering it is. Um, I can't have member A, B fail. I put it in the context of books where, okay, if that fails, then that's not a huge catastrophe. But if the books are actually cars and this is a section of a little bridge or whatever, I don't know why this would be a section of a bridge, but if it's a, a frame that there's something sitting on, then I have to be a lot more careful about how I actually select the material for member A, B select the cross section you know is it a i beam or a rectangular beam how big is it all those kind of things um, but in order to know that i have to know what forces are acting on it and so the point of doing this analysis is to figure out the forces that are acting on each one of these pieces so that then i can take those forces and design the actual pieces so i can pick materials and sizes cross sections that sort of thing so that I know it won't fail when I go to put it in service for a bookshelf. Probably that is overkill. 
Um, but the same process would be the, the we would follow the same steps. <clears throat> so, um, step four here, we had just found the external reactions. Step four is to figure out um, the individual pieces. So in our simple example, we have three individual pieces, A, B, B, C, and A, C. Um, and ours will be redundant, um, but we're going to do them all anyway um, so that we can see how they interact with each other on a more complicated frame uh, or machine than you probably will have to draw most of them at this you know this is the first one we're looking at so um, technically I could just draw member a B and be done but uh, we we're gonna do all of them so let's do let's draw and then do the calculations for each one so um, I am envisioning taking out pin a you know the actual physical hardware that's holding a together and then B and C and looking at these three pieces So there's A. I'll put them sort of arranged, kind of in an exploded way. There's the uh, vertical piece. And then over here, you do not have to put them, uh, you know, arranged like this. Whoops, that's, that's a, another A. But I'm doing it to kind of make sure that we're all making sense here. Um, so AB has that 30 pound force on it. And um, let's look at AC and BC first because we decided that they were two force members. So the two force member, because they only have two pins, A and C or B and C, and there were no external forces applied on the member itself. There are forces at A and forces at C, but they're not on the body of the member. Um, so those are two force members, which means I can look at AC and I can give it um, a force set. So this is just the force in AC. Now, I don't necessarily know if it's in tension or compression. I chose to draw it in tension. Um, maybe you can look at this and tell that, oh, well, it's really in compression or it's really in tension or whatever. And, um, well, those are your only two choices, um, and draw the arrows the correct way. I just chose a direction. So BC, I'm going to do the same thing. I'll put it in compression. It looks like it's in compression just because we usually don't put them in compression or we haven't been doing that. So we can see what happens if we do. Now, that looks fine, but um, I now have assigned, if we look at B, for instance, I've assigned that at point B, there is a force FBC. I don't know its value, magnitude, but I know there's a force there. Um, and I know I have two point Bs because they were bolted together and I've taken them apart. So um, on the other B, I have to draw that reaction. So I have to put FBC, it has to go the other direction, same magnitude, but the other direction because they're equal and opposite. You know, these, these have to be equal magnitude, opposite direction. Um, anywhere I have two points, uh, you know, I've got B and then the other matching B on another piece where they were bolted together. They have to have the reactions to one another. So FBC on part AB is the reaction to the FBC on part BC and vice versa. Um, so we have the same thing happening at, at A. So I need to draw the equal and opposite direction there. Then... We also have the same thing happening at C, but C is different. I didn't mind putting forces on AB because it already wasn't a two force member. So what's another force on there? It doesn't really 
make it worse of a not two force member. It just has more forces. So I didn't mind putting extra forces on there, but I kind of don't want to put forces on either AC or BC because then they wouldn't be two force members. They would be three forces, which is not the same thing. Um, but I have an option because there's another thing at C, which is the actual pin at C, like the physical bolt that's holding AC and BC together. So that thing I can take and I can put, well, it has to react that force in BC. It also has to react the force in AC. And technically, I still haven't taken care of CX over here uh, that we know is an external reaction. And I don't want to put it on AC or BC for the same reason I didn't want to put other forces on there because I want to keep them as two force members. So I'm going to put CX on this pin. It turned out it was 18 pounds. So I'm going to put those 18 pounds here um, so that I don't have to, because I don't want to do this. I, whoops. Lost my screen. I don't want to put CX there because then that makes BC not a two force member. I can't do FBC. I have to do BXBY, CXCY, and it's just a, a lot worse situation. It would eventually work, but it would be much more complicated simultaneous equations to deal with. Um, this works just as well, and I don't have to mess up my two force members. I still have. AX and AY that I haven't put anywhere. Um, they are, I have the option, AX and AY could either go to member AB or they could go to member AC. Again, AC is a two force member, so I don't want them to go, to go there. So I'm gonna put them on AB, which um, let's see, AX was 18 pounds. It actually sh should be pointing to the left. So I'm gonna go ahead and correct it. And AY, it was 30 pounds and it should be going up. So now I've got all three members plus the pin at C. I could draw the pin at A also, but I don't need to um, because I can just put those forces directly on member A, B and deal with them there. Uh, so I don't have to pull out the pin separately and think about it as its own thing. Um, so I've got the three free body diagrams plus the pin at C. And I can each one of those. So the next step, step five. Is solve my equilibrium equations. And I can use all three. I can use the summation of forces in the x direction equals zero, in the y direction, and since these are not concurrent force systems, um, actually AC and BCR, those are concurrent because they're just the same line of action, but AB is not a concurrent force system. So on the ones that aren't two force members, I can also use a summation of moments at some point equals zero. And I can do that for each free body diagram. So technically I can write four sets of these equations uh, when I include the pin at C. Converting, I would not say I am converting a frame problem into multiple two force member problems because there are frames that have no two force members. Um, uh, so that's that's probably not the best way to think about it. I am looking to take advantage of any two force members I do have, but you could have a frame with zero two force members. What you're doing is, um, and I've used this word before kind of maybe without telling you what it really means, but this member AB, this becomes a beam. And, uh, and I might have, you know, accidentally called the pieces of a truss a beam, but they're not, they're members. Um, and this beam now falls into this category where now I have beam deflection equations. I can calculate uh, how much this beam is going to bend. I uh, have a lot of new stuff that we haven't gotten to yet. We'll do that in uh, probably a two weeks maybe, uh, somewhere in that time frame. 
Um, I have beam stress equations, flexural stress equations. Notice up until this point, like up until today, all the stuff before today, all I could do whenever the P, when I was thinking about the mechanics of a plate or rod or string or cable, all I could do is calculate that it was getting longer or shorter. That's all I, all I could do. I could do stress and strain and all those kind of things, but as far as the way it acted, it was only getting longer or shorter. But once I put this 30 pounds in the middle of AB or near the middle of AB, now things are starting to flex. So we're in that middle third of the quarter where the first third is axial. So things are just getting longer or shorter. Um, now we're in the middle, which is flexural. Now things can bend. Uh, and so remember AB becomes this beam category and it can flex or bend and you know it could make like a smiley face shape if I push on it hard enough or it can make an S shape if it's got different loads or whatever it does I'm still not thinking about twisting yet we're gonna save that to the very end um, but now we're venturing into the flexural mechanics so we were just axial now we're flexural that's why we have to treat these differently from trusses trusses were only axial the members only had axial forces on them um, they could only stretch or compress. Technically, they could buckle, but we, we mentioned that, but we're going to actually say buckling to the very end. Um, but now we have pieces, members, that are beams that can flex and bow up or bow down or turn into some wavy shape or whatever. Um, and member AB could do that. If We're just not going to calculate that yet. That's a couple of weeks from now. Um, so looking at this, really the easiest thing to do would be to go to the pin at C and solve for the rest of your, our, our only unknowns are AC and BC. That's the only unknowns we have. Um, so the easiest thing would be to go to C and solve for them there, like a 2D concurrent force system. So that'd be the easiest thing. We're not going to do that just because, um, we're going to do a little practice on dealing with the beams. And the beam is member AB. I can't do anything with AC or BC by themselves. All it says is that FAC equals FAC and FBC equals FBC. So I don't, it doesn't gain anything. Um, that's why normally uh, it's not even useful to draw the two force members. In this case, we just did it to, as an exercise. But let's look at AB. So see if I can get it by itself. Um, we do need our dimensions on there. I think I made this three inches and this one four inches. Um, we also need something here. I'm going to make this angle. I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to say, let's see, let's go back to the original one, that the rise of member BC is five and it has a run of seven. So I'm going to put Rise of five, run of seven, which gives it a hypotenuse for this little blue triangle here of, let's see, I don't know, five squared plus seven squared. Square root, I'm using a different calculator again today, so i um, got to find out where all the buttons are. 8.6, we'll say. Okay, that's a little bit of rounding, but not too much. <clears throat> All right, so um, now I've got something that's similar to when we were doing the external reactions to a truss. Um, it's not a truss at all, it's just a beam, but I can kind of act on it the same way, where I've got my three equilibrium equations, and I can go through them one by one and see which ones might help me. So if I do X, I have two unknowns in X. I have, uh, no, there's only one unknown in X, the X component of BC. So that might be a good spot to start. There's two unknowns in Y, AC and the Y component of BC. Uh, I could use a moment and figure out one of the AC or BC, but let's do X. So the summation of forces in the X direction for my free body diagram, I have... Uh, negative 18 pounds 
uh, I guess I should technically specify that X is positive when it goes right and Y is positive when it goes up, just to be 100% sure. So negative 18 pounds, that's from this guy. And then I have drawn BC going to the right, so that's plus FBC, but I only want the X component. Now, in this case, you could go calculate the angle, do the inverse tangent, calculate the angle, and do a cosine or, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but in this case, I did the, the triangle. So that little triangle right there, the 5, 7, 8.6. And another way that you can deal with X and Y components, if you have this kind of information, is, oh, well, FBC, the X component is just 7s in the X direction. So 7 over the hypotenuse of that little blue triangle is 8.6. So that's the exact same thing as finding the angle and doing the cosine of that angle and multiplying times FBC. It turns out that the cosine of whatever that angle is, is 7 divided by 8.6. So um, that's a, a way that might make more sense to you, or maybe it doesn't. You don't have to do it, but if it makes sense and it seems obvious on easier way to do it then you can uh, use those when you have that kind of rise over run type information um, all right uh, those two have to add together to equal zero so we move 18 to the other side and then divide by 7 over 8.6 so 18 divided by 7 divided by 8.6 the quantity of that is 22 22.11 pounds. I didn't, uh, yeah, the 18 has pounds on it. Um, that 22.11 pounds came out positive. That means that every FBC arrow I drew is the correct orientation as long as I was careful to keep uh, equal and opposite reactions. So when I drew BC, the FBC at B is pointing down into the left. The FBC at C is pointing up and to the right. The same magnitude, opposite direction. Um, same thing when I drew the two locations for B. Uh, they have same magnitude, but opposite direction. So as long as I kept up with that, same thing when I did C, the pin at C. Equal magnitude, opposite directions. Then every instance of FBC is the correct orientation. Since this number is positive. And the same is true if um, it had come out negative. If I calculated it and FBC was negative 22, that means every instance of FBC that I drew on my free body diagrams, they're all backwards. So um, it is important. That's why I drew these extra free body diagrams that we don't really need. Um, it is important to be able to draw the matching free body diagrams correctly and label the forces correctly. Um, so that stuff like that works. Um, there are certainly frames and machines where uh, you do need to draw multiple free body diagrams. And in that case, you do need to make sure that you've got all of your forces equal uh, in opposite direction for any kind of reactions. Okay. Um, so we have a value for FBC. Uh, to get FAC, we have a couple of choices. Um, why don't we do moments about B? Oh, let's write it in this way. Um, you could also do summation forces in the Y direction and get FAC, whichever, that's that whatever. There's two ways you could do this. So I'm going to do moments about B. So... At point B, FBC and the 18 pound force, their line of action, lines of action, they intersect point B. So they do not create moments about point B. The 230s and the FAC uh, do have, they do create moments about B. So that's the ones I'm going to deal with. 
So the 30 at A, 30 pounds, it has a seven inch moment arm. The 30 kind of in the middle is going counterclockwise. So it has negative 30. That negative is because I chose clockwise as being my positive orientation. Um, so 30 pounds and it has a four inch moment arm to point B. Uh, the way I drew FAC is also negative, so minus FAC, and it has 7-inch moment arm. All right, so when I add these, I have, that's 210 inch-pounds minus 120 inch-pounds um, equals FAC times 7 inches. So I moved the FAC to the other side and became positive. So let's see I have what I've got. 210 minus 120 on the left hand side divided by 7 so I get that FAC is again it's positive 12.86 we'll say and same thing where it has a positive sign so that same rule applies every FAC um, is drawn correctly. Let's see. We only need member AB, yes. Um, uh, yeah, that's generally true. Um, it's not entirely true that you can completely ignore the other pieces because they do have these forces on them, but you don't have to draw their pictures to calculate it. We could have, uh, like, if I were doing this, so if I started up here, then what I would have done is I would have found AX and AY, drawn member AB, and did this little step that we just completed and be done with the whole problem. Um, like I, I would know everything about it in that case. We went through more details just as an academic exercise and to kind of show that uh, how the pieces, the reactions work when you have two B's. There's B here and there's B on the other piece too. And so what do you do when there's two of them? What do you do when there's a force 18 pounds here that you don't want to put on either of your two force members? Well, you can put it on just the pin that was holding those two force members together. So that's kind of why we did an extended version here. You wouldn't really need to do all of those steps every time just because um, you probably aren't solving a problem where all of them are important. Now, in the design of this, they all are important because I have to correctly size the bolt at C. So I have to make sure that that bolt doesn't have so much shear stress on it that it shears and fails. I have to design the cross sections for A, B, A, C, and B, C. They might all be different, or at least they could all be different. Um, I have to design A, B to not deflect too much. So there's a lot of other stuff that goes on once you've calculated all these member forces and everything. But I could have known all of them just by solving this. Actually, I could have known all of them just from this one little thing right here. So um, once you get more comfortable with the process of it, then there are certainly shortcuts you can take. I am giving you pretty much the um, everything uh, view right now. So we're not skipping any of the little steps. Um, let's see. Why don't we... Let's look through uh, web work and see if we can find one that's worth looking at. And then uh, that can... Let me... I'll get you on here. Let's see. Oh, i got to log in. Let's see. This Actually, this might be a good one. So this is a frame. It's got a little bit different configuration. Um, there's a pin and there is a roller, but they're not on the same plane. Um, it has an external force F. Uh, it has a distributed load. It has two pieces that have three pin or, well, two, this one has two pins and a roller. This one has three pins on it. So it uh, has BD that has two pins and no force. BD is a two force member. So this has a little bit of everything. Why don't we work on this? Plus, it's actually trying to solve for stress, uh, stre uh, uh, shear stress, and a 
Well, we can't do deflection. Oh, no, that's the deflection for BD. It's just in compression, so we actually can do that. Um, so let's, let's work on this one for a bit. Got to copy it and get it over to here. Okay, so here's our problem. Um, I think, why don't we draw our free body diagram for this and label everything. Um, it would certainly be faster if I just drew on top of this, but that's generally not what I want you to do. But um, just for the sake of time, why don't we do that in this case? Uh, again, that's not normally the best approach, but it's going to be okay for for what we're going to do. So I'm going to go in here and kind of uh, erase some of these things. Looks like my color is not quite the right color, but that's okay. Okay, now we'll put in, so now we've got the free body, and now we're gonna put in all the forces. So this was a roller, we're just gonna replace it with EY. This F over here for me was 2400 Newtons. A is a pin, so we're going to replace it with AY and AX. On these external reactions, I generally just put them in the positive direction and let it work itself out. Um, this distributed load across the top, it was labeled W. I don't see W. Let's, where is it at? Oh, there it is. 2300. And it has different units. Newtons per meter. Uh, and we need some dimensions. Let's uh, R, S, T, U, and V equal. Um, R is 290. S, 340. T, 350. U, 890. And V is 430. All right, so we kind of cheated, but um, uh, yeah, no, optional two, it'll come open later today. This is actually from uh, set optional two, um, the optional problems that relate to exam two. So it'll come open later today. So you can't technically see your version of this just yet. Why don't I open that real quick in case you do want to see it as you're watching this. Uh, let's see if I can do that relatively fast um, depends on how fast the internet goes let's see let's see so it's open now I gotta make it not closed or it's assigned to you. You just got to make it not closed. Um, I don't know when. Let's just say they're over there. I may have to change the due date on it eventually because um, it might be after exam two, but it should be open now. Why did you choose joint A for AX and AY and not joint C? I'm not sure which problem you're referring to. I assume this one. E Y. Oh, oh, okay. Um, over here. Oh, oh. Uh, well, you may not have seen. Let's let's show you the original problem. Um, you may not have seen what it looks like. Um, let me find it in here. This is problem one. You should be able to see optional two now. Um, problem one. So A was a pin. So in I, I erased it or colored over it. So A was a pin. Um, C is a pin, but it's not an external pin. It's a pin that is just connecting the CDE to ABC piece. Um, A is connecting the whole thing to the ground. So down here is the ground. Kind of They kind of drew a um, 
concrete looking patch of area. Um, and so that's representing the ground or the some surface anyway. And so I need for this to be a free body diagram, I need to disconnect this thing from all the world, which means I have to get rid of this connection over here at this little step at E uh, where the roller is. And I need to get rid of this little connection at A where it's connected to something that looks like concrete floor. Um, otherwise, it's not a free body. It's still connected. So that's why I chose it that way. All right. Now, um, following our steps, this is, we have to decide is a frame or a machine. I already said this is a frame. Um, in fact, the title says uh, distributed load frame, so that's a clue too. But um, it's a frame because it has multiple pieces. Again, only three, but it has multiple pieces, but they're not configured in a way where they could actually move around without bending. So they're not made to be a machine. It's made to be a frame. So it looks like a frame. That means that the probably the best thing I need to do is um, solve for the external reactions. So that's where I'm at right now is I've cheated a little bit and I used this picture and drew over the top of it to create the free body diagram. And I want to find AXAY and EY. So um, that leaves me with my three equilibrium equations. I'm going to go ahead and do summation of forces in the X direction. Um, I've got, I guess I should do something with the distributed load. Um, for that distributed load, uh, it says it's 2300 newtons per meter for the purposes of reaction calculations, not for flexure stuff, which we're not doing yet, but for re reaction equations, I need to lump that into a single force. So it is... 2300 newtons for every meter long it is and it is 890 plus 430 divided by a thousand meters so 3036 newtons right in the middle of the distributed load which I guess 890 plus 430 divided by 2 is 660 millimeters <clears throat> okay um, let's see we've got some material properties remember BD is annealed invar cross-section we don't need those just yet right now we just want to know the uh, reaction forces so looks like we're good to solve for summation of forces in the X direction the only things I see in the X direction are 2400 Newtons and AX. That distributed load, it does have a concentrated or lumped load. Sometimes uh, you call this a lumped load, meaning that it represents the single like point effect of this whole distributed load. So um, there's nothing else in the X direction, so that means that uh, we can just say that AX, uh, well, AX equals negative 2400 Newtons. So it actually should be going the other direction. That's okay. Um, in the Y direction, I could write that equation, but there's two unknowns, AY and EY. So I'm going to skip it and I'm going to write summation of moments. I will choose to do the summation of moments about point A. That's just... Um, if there's not a specific reason, I usually do the moments about wherever the pin, the external pin holding the thing to the ground, wherever that was. So that eliminates AX and AY. I have the 2400 Newtons with a oh, got to add together 690 millimeter, uh, which I will go ahead and convert to meters. So let's make it 0.69 meters. 
um, clockwise. I've got the lumped version of the distributed load. If I were keeping the distributed load, I'd have to like integrate across it. I'd have to use calculus. But for reactions, I can just go in and use that lumped load version. So it's going to be plus 3036 newtons with a 0 0.66 meter moment arm. Then I've got minus EY with a, I don't remember the number, 890 plus 430, 1320, so a 1 1.32 meter moment arm. The only unknown in there is EY, so we should be able to solve for it. 2400 times 0.69 plus the quantity 3036 times 0.66, I think, yeah, 66 divided by 1.32 2000 uh, it's positive which means I drew the EY arrow the right way uh, 2772 point we'll do 55 Newtons I'll do the extra decimal just because we're in web work and it usually likes more decimals now we can do summation of forces in the y direction and we have a y um, minus 3036 newtons plus EY which we just calculated as 2772.55 newtons so therefore we can solve for AY um, I've got that number we just had minus 3036 we move that to the other side so um, that becomes positive and AY looks like it equals 200, sorry, sliding around on me, uh, 263.45 Newtons. Let me quickly check these in. Oh, I don't have those answers in. Okay, I won't check those. Um, we'll just assume they're right. The 3630 or the 3036 Newton force, that is the um, representation of the distributed load. The pink thing across the top with all the arrows, that is a distributed load. And um, what that's representing is, I don't know, maybe there's a, um, a swimming pool that's all the same depth sitting on top of this thing and instead of you know showing it as a single point load when they drew the diagram they show it as a distributed load so and it's a distributed load that for every meter you have it weighs uh 2300 newtons so every meter of length from c to e and there are 890 plus 430 millimeters so that's 1.32 meters of um, so this distance is 1.32 meters. If I have a distributed load that is uh, 2300 newtons per meter and it's spread out over 1.32 meters, that is 3036 newtons total. And that 3036 newton total is... Um, an easier thing to deal with when I'm writing like a moment equation or forces in Y equation. It doesn't represent if I were trying to do deflection, like that would make the beam bend differently, a distributed load versus a point load. But as far as these equilibrium equations, it has the same effect. So um, that's what the 3036, I might even should have put it in a different color because it's not an additional load. It is replacing the distributed load. All right, so we've done our external reactions. When we were looking at the problem, we did actually do the step where we decided that member BD was a two force member. So we kind of did that step. Um, we decided that none of the others were two force members. They had forces on them. They had more than two pins, all this kind of stuff. So uh, BD is the only two force member. And now it's time to draw the individual free body diagrams. 
Um, I think again on this one, I'll draw all of them, even though we don't need the two force member one, I'll draw it uh, just to have it out there. So let's start with this one. So this is A, B, C, and it has um, A, Y, which we just found, 263.45 newtons. It has A, X. I, when I calculated A, X, it was supposed to go this other way, so I'm going to draw it the correct way. Um, at B, there is the force in member B, D. So uh, that, I'm just going to draw this way, force in member BD. I don't know its value, but I know it's a two-force member. Um, there's the 2,400 newtons. And then C is connected to member CDE. They are not two-force members, so I'm just going to put my regular pin reactions there. Um, I can go do dimensions on this one, but we'll save uh, that for a second. Let's draw the other pictures. Let's draw the member of BD, since we kind of referenced it here. We decided it was a two-force member. I've already drawn one force BD, so all these have to be in relation to that. So this one has to be same magnitude, opposite direction, same magnitude, opposite direction over here so that everything's in equilibrium. Um, and that's all I have for BD. Let's draw, actually let's move this down a little bit to move, make room for the top member. There we go. So let's put the top piece on here. So I've already Assigned forces direct or well assigned force variable names and directions at C on the vertical piece So I have to have the same names opposite directions on the horizontal piece Because these are reactions to one another um, I've already done the same thing at D so I need the um, Equal and opposite reactions here At E I have EY, which I calculated, and it was um, 27, there it is, 27, 72.55 newtons pointing upwards. So other than the dimensions, we've got all our variables on there. Now, let's, that 2400 down here is just kind of crooked. There, that's a little better. Um, now, we need to pick one of these to work on. So th there's nothing we can do with the uh, member BD. It does nothing but two unknowns. Uh, either one of the other pieces, they have at least one, un one known value. So we need that. We need to have some number that we know. Both of them have at least one number. And both of them only have two unknowns. So they both have, actually they both have the same two unknowns. CX, CY, and BD. So we can, oh, you know what? I left off the... Uh, the distributed load. Um, I left off that. I want to keep it as the lumped load. Again, you can do that as long as all you're doing are static equations like the uh, x, y, and moment. But once you start doing the mechanic stuff, the fle flexural, which we haven't gotten to yet, we have to redistribute it into a distributed load. Um, so we could do either one of these. I don't know if any either one's easier than the other one. Um, it looks like the top one has less stuff on it. Let's do that. So I'm going to copy it just to isolate it down here. Um, and let's put our dimensions on it that we know. So that dimension is 890 millimeters this dimension 430 and then I'm going to again 
use the um, rise over run for this FBD. So the rise for that triangle is um, it is 290 plus 340 is the rise. So 630. And the run for that part of the triangle is 890, right? Yeah. This dimension is 660 millimeters. Let's go ahead and do the, the hypotenuse of our little blue triangle. So it's the 630 squared plus 890 squared. And the square root of that number is 1090.4. Okay, now we've got everything that we need on this piece and we can apply our three equilibrium equations. Um, I have two unknowns in the x direction, two unknowns in the y direction, so that's leaving me that I probably need to do the moment equation. Let's do the summation of moments about C. That way I get rid of CX and CY. Technically I get rid of the X component of BD also. So that is the 3036 newtons times uh, 0 0.66 meters. Only the Y component of FBD. So um, minus FBD, the Y component is 630 over 1090.4. Time. Don't, when you do this though, don't forget to multiply times the moment arm also of 890. So zero, whoops. I'd been doing it this way, 0 0.89 meters minus 2,700, I think that's 72.55 newtons with a, uh, what is it, 1320, I think, 890 plus 430, 1320, which is 1.32 meters. Those add to zero. The only unknown in there is BD. If we can just get it out of there, then we've found the value for BD. Um, so part of the goal here is to find BD, so force in BD, so we can find the stress and member BD. Um, we won't need the modulus of elasticity for that, but they also, they do want us to find delta BD. So part C here is delta BD, which is the axial deformation, which you do need the axial stress for that. Now the, the modulus of elasticity, which you get, you have to look it up. They don't give it to you in this problem statement. They say it is made of annealed invar. Invar is a material uh, that you can look up the modulus of elasticity of. So that's where that would come in if we were going that far with the problem. Let's see if we can get um, BD out of here. So 3036 times 0.66 is 2000, oh wait, 2003. 0.76, those would be Newton meters minus FBD. Let's see if we can get this one, 630 divided by 1090. 0.4 times 0.89 uh, FBD times um, 0 0.514 minus 2772.55 times 1.32 is 3659.77 equals 0. Um, we've got 2003.76 minus 3659.77 um, that gives us a negative 16 I'll move that to the other side of the equal sign so it will become positive so negative FB times 0 0.514 equals a positive 1656.01 newton meters I left off the new units there divide that by negative 0.515 514 and I get 
if BD equals a negative, that means I drew all the FBD arrows the wrong way, which seems a bit odd to me, but maybe, maybe I could, we'll see. Um, 3,221.8 Newtons. Okay, so um, that negative sign, all F, B, D arrows are backwards. So I drew F, B, D in compression. Just looking at the thing, I just looked at it and thought, oh, that's in compression. Turns out it's actually in tension. It's actually being stretched. Um, and I can kind of believe that the way it's loaded, it's got some convoluted ways it wants to move that okay i can believe that it's probably not a a large well it's 3000 newtons i guess um but uh to figure out if we're on the right track we can try to calculate this um uh change well axial stress in member bd let's do that we have the force in member bd uh so the axial stress has to do with stress equals force over area so sigma BD equals the force in BD over the area of BD, cross-sectional area. The force is, um, technically, it's a tensile force, right? Because I drew it in compression and it came out negative. So it's a tensile force. So uh, 3,221.8 newtons. The area must be described in the problem statement. Um, yeah, here it is. BD has a rectangular cross section of 46 millimeters by 18 millimeters. So um, it says that it's a solid rectangle, 46 by 18. So those are millimeters though. So 0 0.014 meters times 46. I think it was 18, wasn't it? 18 by 46. So this is a 18. And 3221.8 divided by 0 0.018. Ah, I still draw it rust. I want a 14 in there apparently, but it's 46. Divided by um, 0 0.046. So I get um, 3891062.8. So that's 3.89 megapascals. And if we plug that number, 3.89 megapascals, then yes, that is correct. So that we did do, we did everything correct, which is good. Um, let's see if there's any, um, if the weight's pushing down, let's push BD down. Well, yeah, so that's why uh, this talking about member BD being actually in tension, uh, it is uh, difficult to, to just look at this picture and assume that, oh, yeah, that's in tension. Um, that's why I don't spend a whole lot of time trying to figure it out when I'm drawing these free body diagrams and I just get to choose, you know, I get to choose which way to make one of these first arrows and looked like compression to me, so I drew the arrow in compression and then made all the others follow suit from that. Um, as long as you make all of them equal magnitude in the opposite directions every time you write a new one of them, then it doesn't really matter. Your, your equations will tell you if you got it right or wrong um, as far as the direction. And if you got it wrong like we did, it's like, oh, well, it wasn't in compression, it's in tension. And then I know that over here, I could technically go in and put a T on that, but to specify that that's in a tensile stress. Um, because some materials do behave differently in tension and compression. Plus, uh, this little bar, I imagine it's relatively thin, and it would behave differently in compression because it could buckle. 
And again, we haven't gotten to buckling yet. Um, yeah, so in my case, I just picked one. I guessed, oh, that one's probably in compression and drew all my arrows. Notice all the arrows are showing compressive directions. They're all pointing towards the free body diagram. So I drew them all in compression. And then turns out that I was wrong. What that means is that, oh, it's just intention. So it doesn't, you don't have to go back and do anything. You don't have to correct anything. It's just, oh, I drew those arrows wrong. Uh, they're the opposite of that. Um, obviously, that doesn't work on like this 2400 right here that is given to you as a certain direction. But the ones where you're just having to solve for it, just don't spend a whole lot of time trying to manipulate in your mind what's going on. Just pick something and carry on with the problem. Because in the end, your equation will tell you if you pick the right thing or not. <clears throat> and so that's that's why I don't spend a whole lot of time trying to sort it out ahead of time. Um, it does help, I assume. So like I assume that it does give you this little bit of confidence if you look at it and it looks one way and turns out the equation says it's that way, that probably helps a little bit. Like in my case, I had to go back and like, uh, that's not what I thought it was. And I had to spend a little bit of time convincing myself that, well, I could see how that bar is being stretched. Um, you know, you've got something where maybe in the, if I were thinking of deflection, this thing is having to do something like that. This one's doing some weird shape and that this point and this point really are being pushed away from each other. And, and it's like, oh, okay, I can kind of believe it, but it's a lot of mental effort up front on something that doesn't actually matter as far as calculating the numbers go. Um, so on an exam situation, don't spend an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out if member BD is in tension or compression. Just pick one, make all your arrows work out that way for member BD and solve the problem. All right. That's probably, I mean, there's more to this problem. They're, they want us to know, um, actually, the, the other thing, they want to know delta B, D, and they want to know the shear stress on the pin at C. So there is some more stuff they want to solve for this problem. That's probably enough for us to do today on frames of machine. Again, this is not, this is on exam two. So this is not even on exam one. Um, so probably enough for, for today on exam two. I'll leave the chat open for a little bit. We've got a, we don't have a lot more time. But we have a little more time if there's a specific thing about exam one. I'm just looking over here at The, um, well, we zoomed in a lot, didn't we? There we go. So what you'll actually do tomorrow during the exam is you'll go to class 10. There'll be a link right here to a Zoom room. You'll log into Zoom. You don't have to have your microphone on. Um, you will have your camera on because otherwise what's the point in being in Zoom for me to watch? So you do have to have your camera on kind of you, your environment type, type of thing. You don't have to have multiple views or anything like that. Just one of your camera. Um, you will, this will open up over here. Exam one, I, well, I'll rename it 2023. It'll open up um, and you'll start taking the exam. Uh, for any kind of um, scratch work that you do, just write it on a piece of paper and uh, this link here will allow you to upload PDF, picture, PNG, JPEG, whatever, of that you can take. You can just take it with your phone. You don't have to find a set, fancy setup or anything. Just take a picture of your scratch worksheets with your phone, put them into a PDF or whatever format you have, upload them here, and that'll count as turning in your scratch work so that um, we can make sure that uh, if there is any kind of question about a problem, uh, I have your work that your handwritten work that you did and we can go back and look at it. Um, you don't have to turn in any exam uh, handwritten work at all. It's just if you want to have the potential to be able to say, well, here's what I did 
is there any partial credit with that or or here's I just clicked the wrong button then I need to have the stuff turned in um, let's see For, let's see, for the force, this is going back to the uh, problem we just worked out. Let me make sure that I'm looking at the right numbers. Um, you converted them. Oh, well, you did 340. It's actually 430. So that's why it's different. Regarding exam one, can we oh, work set seven, problem one? Well, I don't know if we can do all of those, but it uh, depends on how much time we have. We have 10 minutes. Uh, we can look at, look at them. Let's see, set seven. Problem one. Um, okay, that's a truss. Let's see what the other one is. Set six. Problem one. Oh, um, actually, we might can do both of those. So um, let's see. We can certainly do this one. And then there usually is a problem similar to this on exam one. Not necessarily the same picture, but... Uh, similar. So what this one's asking us to do is nothing except calculate a moment. So it's got a shelf bracket, has an orthogonal force component, so that means they're at right angles. Uh, given the dimensions shown in the table, so I've got some dimensions, find the moments that create, that the forces create about the upper and lower, oh, so about these two points. So um, it wants us to know two different things. Find this point right here, we'll call that point one, and this point right here, we'll call that point two. Find the moment that these two forces create about those two points. So it's just, this one's not equilibrium, this is just what is the moment. So it would be, let's put in our values, Fx is 16 pounds, and Fy is 73 pounds. So the summation of moments about location one, that upper pin, the one that they're, they're calling it upper. Well, we've got to get that a little bit smaller. So all you do is 73 pounds times A, which is 19 inches. Um, going clockwise, the 16 pound line of act. Now, this is one where you have to use a little bit of judgment the technically, technically it's drawn where the line of action for the 16 pound force is up here, right? And there, and the point is slightly below that point. Actually, they give us that. So they give us the one. If they did not give us that one inch, then um, we would just assume that they are lined up together, but they do give us that one. So we can say, um, this goes around clockwise plus 16 pounds times one inch. If that C dimension was there, was not there, then I would just say ignore the 16 times 1, but they, they gave it to us, so we won't ignore it. 73 times 19 is 1387 inch-pounds plus 16 inch-pounds. That's why I would normally say to ignore it because it's small compared to the other one. Um, but in this case, they gave us enough information to calculate it, so... Uh, oh, practice exam set six and seven. Oh, I don't know. Well, we'll finish this. Um, 1387 plus 16. 1403 inch-pounds. Um, let's see. Prast let me see if I can find the practice exam. That's practice for exam one. Um, oh yeah, there's a set six. Okay, um, regarding set six, problem one. Let's see what that looks like. Um, that's not too bad. Um, let's copy it over here. This is a typical-ish type of problem. There's a whole bunch going on, but it's asking for something relatively straightforward. Um, so uh, this one, 
it says these are cold rolled red brass. So that's just a different material. So you can go look up its properties. Uh, they're joined with close fitting pins. So it's got all this like technical sounding stuff, but it just means that um, the pins aren't wobbly in the holes and there's no dynamic properties that you have to worry about. Uh, the pins are made of annealed red brass. Uh, all parts have the same width B. So they have a dimension B labeled. Um, and length A, which they also have labeled. Well, they have it labeled on one of them, but not the others. For the dimensions and loading given, the minimum factor of safety against yielding due to bearing stress. Um, so bearing stress. Remember, that is where you have pins or bolts or some surface pushing on another surface. So... Um, I have two of those situations here. I have the two pins in part A, and I have the three pins in part B. It is not obvious, but it's implied that all the pins are the same diameter. So if um, I only have two pins on part A supporting all of the load versus three pins on part B spreading out the load, then I know that it's the two in A that are going to be the weaker link. So I'm going to look at that part. Um, and it's going to be kind of hard. I have to draw this kind of the other direction so we can see the surfaces, but I'm cutting right through here, by the way, cutting right through there. And then I'm drawing it backwards from the way it's shown in this picture. All right, so we're not interested. Well, just that um, and the surface that is being bared upon is inside here and here those two these two pins are pressing on that surface the force that it has to resist is um, F uh, 29,000 newtons and that force is applied here and here Half of it on each of them, we're going to assume. These other arrows would be 29 over 3, the way I've got. I'm assuming everything's equally spaced and all that kind of stuff. Um, when we have these curved surfaces, then um, the uh, way that we're going to handle it is using what's called a projected area. So instead of trying to deal with the curved surface, we're going to project that curved surface onto a flat plane, which, let's see, I'll get some other color. We'll do orange. That plane will be here and here. Now, the bearing stress is equal to the force. So the total force is, there's two of them, Half of 29K on one of these orange surfaces, the other half on the other one. So I'm just going to lump them together into 29,000 newtons. And the area that that 29,000 newton is acting on, there's two, two orange surfaces here. So two, each of them has a thickness called T1, which for me is 30 millimeters, 0 0.03 meters and a width of whatever the diameter of the pin is, D, 15 millimeters. And that should be 20, oops, calculator went off, 29,000 divided by two, divided by 0 0.03 times 0 0.015. And I get, oh, I don't get an answer that's on the page here. The minimum, oh, factor of safety. That's not actually what I'm solving for. All right, so I get a stress of, let's see, three and a whole bunch of twos. Two, two, two. Oh, wow, can't count them all. Um, one, two, three. Oh, it's 32.2 .2 megapascals. But the problem is asking for a factor of safety. So, um, Factor of safety against yielding. The part that's going to yield is could be either one. It could be the pins could yield, they could crush, or it could be 
the um, hole that they're in could elongate. And the problem doesn't say either one. It just says the minimum factor of safety against yielding. So I have to look up the yield strength of cold red brass and annealed, whoa, annealed red brass. So let's go find those numbers. This is a generally good problem to work on. So that's not a bad one to do. Um, let's see. If I can find, oh, we're on the web over here. The, you will need, um, I don't know if you'll want to print these out, but you'll need access to either your book, which has all this stuff in it, or these kind of poorly made scans of the, the charts from your book. In particular, this one, we need this chart right here. So we need the metric units, and then we need to find, there's cold rolled and annealed red brass. So the yield strength for elastic is what they refer to as yield. Um, compression, these are compressive, so if they have a compression number, we have to use that. Most of these materials don't have a separate compression number. And in fact, these do not. So, wow, I can't, I might have to get my book to see what this says, because uh, my scan of a scan is kind of hard to read. Oh, it's buried. I think this says 100. It looks like 100. Um, so the red, the annealed red brass, which I think was the pin material, is 100 megapascals. And the um, cold rolled red brass is 410. So it's the annealed that's weaker. So we can go back over to our problem here. We have 32.2 megapascals. And the... Sigma yield from the book for the annealed is 100 megapascals. So the factor of safety is equal to the yield strength over our bearing stress, which is 100 megapascals over 32.2, which hopefully is one of these numbers. Let's see, 100 divided by 32.2. Well, that's still not showing up as one of these. Oh, 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 wow, this is a, wow. All right, I see. Um, this is why this problem was retired. <laughs> so um, it's not an error with it. It is a, um, it takes a while to do this problem and it's just too lengthy. Um, so you get there and this is also a good time the, I know multiple choice is not the ideal thing, but it does let you have a little bit of a, a way to check because this number is, uh, I don't know, 3.19 or something, 100 divided by 32.2. Yeah, 3.1, which is not one of our options. So you get to looking at it and like, well, I know it's, I know it's where the two pins are, and then you notice, oh, look at this piece. T2 is actually thinner than T1. And when you look at your numbers over here, that's true. T2 is 25 millimeters, which changes that number. And then our bearing stress on the bottom plate is uh, 29,000 divided by 2 divided by... 0.025 times 0.015. Um, so our new for the bottom plate is uh, 38.67 megapascals. Same yield strength, 100 divided by 38.67 is 2.58, which is J. So, um, that's why this one is on the retired list is just it's it's a good problem but for an exam and this was probably like six points worth so it's kind of a low weight for the amount of work that this one takes uh it it's a lot to do in a reasonable amount of time so we did it but it you know even with explaining it it was kind of kind of lengthy and that's why it got retired um the other one you mentioned um Oh, let's see. Um, 
So in this case, it's it's uh, not going to technically break the, the way that we think of normally fracture. A bearing stress failure is it just crushed something. So it didn't necessarily fracture things apart. But this one does, this problem does specifically say that we're looking at bearing stress uh, in the problem statement. So we're looking, where is it going to crush things? And so it's going to crush things in the hole. It's either going to crush the pins or the hole the pins are in. Then we should have paid more attention. I just started, I just made the distinction between that, well, part A is going to have high, higher than part B because it's got fewer pins. So there's more force per area on A than there is B because there's more more area for the pins to push on part B than there is in part A. But I didn't pay attention that part C is actually thinner. So it has an even thinner amount of material and it's this 0.03 versus the number for um, part C is 0.025 and that makes the difference. So there's a lot going on in this problem. Why it got retired. Um, let's see. So part C, actually the pins in part C, so the piece of the pin that's in part C would crush and the whole joint would stay together. It wouldn't like fall apart, but now the pins would be loose in part C and it's possible that they could slide out or, or something like that could happen. Uh, so it's not that uh, anything fractures. In fact, we're even talking about a yielding stress, so it's just that it deforms. All right. Um, let's just look at the other one you said. I don't know that I'll have time to work on it. It was on 7. Let's see. Practice for exam 1. 7. Um... Let's see, I lost where it was at. Um, oh, it was also problem one. Uh, let's see. Okay, that one, I don't think that one's too uh, much to do, but uh, just to walk through it, um, this one is, well, this, this one has the AB, instead of giving you an angle theta or whatever, it gives you the rise over run. Um, so you can do the same things that we were doing with the frames today. This one is just a uh, resultant. So again, not equilibrium. What you end up doing is drawing uh, the two forces at that little knot on the log and just calculate their resultant. They give you the two forces. So I'll set up the picture. And then we'll call it a day. So you end up doing this. Your x-axis, you can leave the x and y-axis exactly where they're at, and then you've got Jimmy over here with his uh, six pounds, and you've got John over here with his uh, 26 pounds, and you've got a couple of pieces of information on angles. Uh, you've got 52 degrees here and you don't have an angle but you have the uh, rise well that's the run rise over run and on this one all you're trying to do is uh, calculate a resultant not an equilibrium problem so you would just say that ry equals uh, 6 times the sine of 52 degrees plus 26 times you'd have to figure out let's see I guess we're going to solve this um, 2 squared plus 5 squared and the square root of that number 5.39 that's the hypotenuse so for the y component you would have 5 over 5.39 so there's your ry I think it's 
doing it kind of quick over here so I don't know I don't not even sure if my calculator is in uh, radian or degree mode right now you wouldn't want to make sure that you're in the right mode when you're solving these things rx would be 6 times cosine 52 degrees minus um, the 26 times 2 over 5.39 so let's see if I can do that oh wait cosine of 52 times 6 minus 26 times 2 divided by 5.39 negative so it's pointing over towards John's side 5.953 they want to know the resultant magnitude so r is the square root of rx squared plus ry squared so x squared plus and I get um, 29.45 is a 29.48 I'd go back and check my work you know I might have rounded something um, well I did I rounded that 5.39 on the uh, right there I rounded that so the, but that's the process you would use so you have to make sure if you're doing a, res, a resultant problem where you're just trying to um, resolve the two or more forces into a single resultant or if you're doing an equilibrium problem um, so this one uh, is technically not an equilibrium problem it's just calculating the resultant of two forces all right um, I will see y'all sometime tomorrow most of you anyway um, I'll post the zoom link in Moodle and whenever you're ready at noon or 730 whichever time slot you want to do then